I'd like to welcome these four speakers to our panel and also introduce two more panel members. Gabrielle Wong Perodi is an assistant professor in the Department of Earth System Science and a center fellow at the Woods Institute for Environment at Stanford University. Shafiq Jaffer is the vice president of corporate science and technology projects in North America for Total. This morning's panel will be moderated by Arun Majumdar, a faculty member in the departments of both mechanical engineering and material science and engineering, and the co-director of the Precourt Institute for Energy. So the plan is uh, for Arun to start with a few questions for the panel, and then we'll take some questions for the audience. So over to you, Arun. Um, first of all, uh, it's been a fascinating three days of discussions and uh, I missed the first part of the first day because of another event, but I listened to the rest. And just putting today's in the context of the previous two days, and we heard in day one sort of the, the scale of the problem, and I'm gonna summarize it very, very briefly, the scale of the problem and the opportunity that is there to uh, make a difference, or sometimes the lack of it. And certainly Sally talked about the magnitude of the energy and the emissions related to that, and, and we heard uh, on, on land-based as well as on, on sea, ocean-based, what the capacity is and what the opportunities are. On day two, we talked about and we listened to some of the, you know, how complex the system is on a macro view. And, you know, there are lots of opportunities in using soil as a, as a sink for carbon, but there are lots of complexities in understanding and, and extrapolating things and over-predicting and over promising. And today, and, and, and the previous two days were sort of macro views. And today we heard sort of the bottom up technological revolution that is happening in, in biotechnology, both from Don and Joe, um, and the opportunities that may be there. And we like to see the connections between the two. But we also heard um, from Larry sort of the, what are the economic tools we have? To, to really accelerate that uh, on carbon tax and the impact and the various implications of that. And from Gretchen, we heard sort of a new paradigm of valuing things that we normally don't do. And it has been adopted by Costa Rica, but you know, could, it, could be used elsewhere in China and many other places of the world. So that is sort of where we are today. And we heard elements of the human interaction the social interaction. And Gabriel, this is your field of research on behavioral science and decision making. So what do you make of all of this? And how would you look at this, bring that perspective into this um, very significant challenge? Um, thank you for the question. I think that when we're thinking about any of these options or any of these types of projects, it's really important um, and what the evidence has suggested that communities and various stakeholders are brought into the conversation early and often um, so that they feel like full participants. It's not only good because of this kind of notion of democratizing science, um, but it's also good because those projects tend to go better. Um, and when there are events where sometimes things go wrong, um, there's already the kind of that, that mesh, uh, that kind of social infrastructure that's there that could be built upon so that these different um, options or these different types of projects can go forward and be more successful. Perfect, so let me move on to Shafiq. And you know, Shafiq, you have been listening to all of this discussion and, and you've been asking questions. And we wanna at some point in a coalesce all of this information into and extract out the research problems that we need to be addressing. So your viewpoint on listening to the three days and how to extract, and what do you take away from this? Well, I think the um, key challenge that I see coming out of this is that the systems level view is critical. I mean, it's a very complex set of interactions. We heard about a lot of the unintended, a lot of the extra benefits, and how do we start quantifying that, uh, I think is a big part of what is needed. I think the points raised by Gretchen today, I think really show kind of the complexity in trying to bring a value to something that doesn't have a dollars and cents to it. How do you put that in light in front of policymakers in terms of industry leaders that here's the value perhaps that is not a direct economic number, 
Um, so I think this kind of systems level kind of interactions has to be much better in understood uh, where those interfaces are, uh, where the complexity lies, where the uncertainties lies. And I think we got a little bit of that uh, through the day two discussions quite well on the soils and things like that, where the soil water, uh, plant water interfaces, coastal ecosystems, uh, things like um, how do you start valuing kind of the efficiencies gained in terms of the uh, yield in crops and that, that really changed the perception of how land use has to change, right? Can you minimize land re uh, disturbances and land uh, re um, changes in terms of reuse and that? So I think this kind of systems level is what I took away today as kind of the primary number one thing we got to really kind of put a framework around. And I think we're getting close from what I see of Gretchen and some of the other uh, discussions we've seen, but I think there's a little bit more nuance that has to be brought into this. So let me then flip back to Gabriel then now, just looking at this, the, the land use issue, and clearly there are sociocultural aspects of decision making in terms of land use, but how land is used in, for example, India is very different from land use could be in China. So how do you bring that aspect to of land use and, and sociocultural aspects of behavior and, and introduce that in the carbon management, carbon removal problem. Yeah, I think that's a huge challenge. And so um, <clears throat> just thinking about some of the work that I've done on the Navajo Nation um, and this critique that's been um, kind of been levied in terms of the development on the nation where decisions were made from a, a techno-economic perspective and not really taking culture into account. So how do you identify what the cultural impacts or the land use impacts are going to be? Um, and, and so in that particular case, uh, we ended up developing a decision support tool for the Navajo Nation that elicited those, those things that, that citizens cared about and integrated it in a more formal fashion, uh, in a, for, a more formal matter into the modeling that's done that helps to inform where projects are cited, how they're cited, what the process is like. And so I think kind of elevating that and, and thinking through how to make some of those intangibles more tangible um, is really critical in terms of research that needs to be done. So there is, there is hope, there is, yes. it can be done. I, I think it can be done. Um, it just takes time and it takes um, a, an acknowledgement that it's necessary in order to have these projects move forward in, in an ethical way and a way that's, that's more successful. Great, let me now flip back to and bring the other panelists who have already spoken. And I want to put the first two talks of Don and Joe in the context of what was presented earlier in the last two days. Uh, I think we have seen the uh, the Griscom paper chart many times in terms yeah. of natural climate mitigation potential. And so that, of course, takes a macro view of things. And clearly, one of the, the cheapest in, the, um, in terms of scale, the avoided forest conversion, um, is a big deal. And I think we, we kind of realize that there are lots of co-benefits of that as as Gretchen pointed out in the bars that, that are there on the left-hand side of the picture. So when I look at the macro picture of that, and clearly um, when Joe and Don, when you talked about the tools that we have, the scientific understanding of affecting photosynthesis and using biotechnology, and if you can use, uh, increase the food productivity, then we can make a dent in the avoided forest conversion. So that I can see one connection, potential connection up there. Help us understand from the bottom up view of things, of using the scientific understanding and the technological tools, how that could be integrated into this macro picture of climate mitigation potential. What are the other levers that are there from the bottom up tool based things of understanding to affect the other mac massive climate potential a mitigation potential. What are you? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I guess I could I could go first. I mean, certainly there are people thinking about um, can we direct more of the biomass um, that we enjoy from more protective productive crops 
um, in a way that is more stable. And so um, there's work going on in terms of um, generating deeper root, rooted plants, generating plants that have a large amount of, of suburin, which is stable in the soil underground. Um, and, you know, and so then there are estimates, you know, tied to that. And um, as, you know, I think as David LaBelle was saying, um, they tend to be um, optimistic. And so the less you know, the more optimistic you're allowed to be. Um, and so I think the proof of concept of how important that potential technological solution of putting more of the extra biomass below ground, um, uh, you know, really isn't known at this point. I think the other truism as well is that um, if we are to believe that we do need 70 to 100 percent increase in overall food production over the next three or four decades, then any biomass that we put below ground um, is going to represent a yield drag and, and you know, be difficult in the context of, of fulfilling this other goal. Joe, you started, you created the ROOTS program at RPE and you ran it. You had a vision for this. You have any mm -hmm. thoughts on that? So <clears throat> uh, building on what Don was saying, I think one of the challenges we have is, and actually when we had workshops talking about carbon sequestration using uh, crops, um, it was, to say it was a heated conversation would be an understatement. Um, you had one camp said that basically we couldn't do this, that basically you would reduce productivity. And you had another camp that said, we've never had the appropriate genetics to actually even, um, even test the hypothesis. So there is a lot of historical um, uh, uh, thinking that actually is not necessarily tied to empirical results going forward. And a big part of that is not having uh, the tools to actually allow us to actually be able to measure some of those endpoints. So what we've actually seen in the last several years through programs like Roots and others is we're now actually creating the tools that actually now allow the biologists to actually test those hypotheses. Um, there's a robust field of opportunity for us to be able to discover and, and breed traits that exist in natural populations. Um, the challenge that we've had in, in many respects is our ability to actually measure the genetic um, impact uh, real time and both within the plant as well as from a carbon perspective with, within the soil. So I'm fairly optimistic that those tools now are starting to um, uh, evolve to the point where they can um, actually help us settle some of those debates on can we or can't we uh, partition carbon effectively uh, and at the same time not jeopardize yield. Joe, let me follow up with you and I'm hoping that there will be some questions and if someone could help me with that from the audience, we can queue them up. You know, we heard also yesterday a reference to um, the idea that, you know, uh, using technologies like Impossible Food or uh, Beyond Meat, there's mm -hmm. a lot more going on and you're part of the Gates Foundation and you know what's going on in that, that realm. You know, Breakthrough Energy is, is investing in that. Can you talk about a, that whole change that is happening and what the potential impact on carbon could be? And what are the unintended consequences, potentially, of that? So when we talk about food, um, I mean, today we've spent most of our time on the production side from an agricultural perspective. But the food value chain, as everyone, know, everyone knows, is a very complex ecosystem that goes from uh, seeds and traits all the way up through to consumer behavior. And as we look across that entire food value chain, there are multiple uh, opportunities for us to actually affect change. Um, 
one of the comments, I think it was, I'm not sure whether it was Monday or Tuesday, where we talked about just the amount of food uh, actually gets diverted in, into protein production. Um, that's actually a social opportunity, but it's also a production opportunity in the context of how can we actually lower that particular impact. Um, the sheer magnitude of the fact that 30% of our food is actually waste. Um, how do we actually uh, uh, harness that partic particular component? When you look at the entire food supply chain, um, the total greenhouse gas impact is between 20 and 30%. Um, now we actually have, those are, those are large enough targets for us to actually think about what innovations we could be occurring, um, not just on the farm, but also as we think about uh, transportation, refrigeration, and ultimately uh, food waste. Let me take that and go over to Gretchen. And Gretchen, you're on my left of my screen out here. Um, and both you and Larry are on the left of the screen. So if I take that line of, you know, we talked about food and agriculture, other biotech tools, and increasing photosynthetic efficiency using biotechnology. And, you know, if you're seeing a paradigm shift in terms of impossible foods and others, have 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 you looked at that in your your global ecosystem of productivity or in other framework to evaluating the impacts of agriculture or changes in food habits into the ecosystem understanding? This is a great conversation. And yeah, you're teeing up a frontier, basically. We've um, certainly looked at it in China. There's been a lot of concern over an ability to maintain domestic food production, especially with questions about international trade and um, concern over um, zoning a lot of the um, rural parts of the country, the so-called Western China, um, for provision of this much broader array of benefits, inclusive of food, but um, often in place of food, in place of growing, say, dry land rice or corn on high, a very steep slope that for societal purposes in a collectivistic um, framework would be better purpose toward flood control. You know, there is a pretty dramatic shift underway and China has the highest um, absolute reforestation rate in the world. And that forest and some natural grassland is coming in in ag lands. So it's a a key place where this kind of analysis um, comes to the fore. And they are, you know, it, uh, the trade-off has made sense at different levels and it's been a very, very high priority of the government. And I think there are probably thousands of papers, there are hundreds in English written just about that trade-off there. So it's, it's crucial. And I wanna drive home, um, a point that Gabrielle is making in this interplay that um, talking with people and um, developing a participatory approach as opposed to um, what's also obviously useful is this sort of macro um, approach just sort of tallying up in a spreadsheet type way with interactions hidden beneath you know what the possibilities are but coming at it from a participatory way is absolutely crucial. Um, Gabrielle's um, very eloquently emphasizing both the ethical and the success rate um, dimensions thereof. And I'd say there's also, relatedly to unpack success a bit, there's a lot of innovation involved in, um, in the participatory process. So I, um, would say that most of the demonstrations I've seen, including in China, where we tend to think of the government as very um, top down and all, that you'd get nothing done if you didn't do it in a participatory way. And uh, there's a heavy emphasis on that there. And, and then certainly in um, all these other parts of the world, we were rapidly referencing. And um, I think we need to go a lot further in the realm you're opening up, Arun, now, and that. Um, the conversation this morning and the past couple days keeps touching on namely um, like what 
<clears throat> where might there be a real shift with some innovations coming along like uh, in Impossible Foods and Beyond Meat, but also um, in private sector engagement and financing, of which um, there's a great need for much more. So um, anyhow, I don't have a, a direct answer just to say that that is a key frontier and the different approaches that we're talking about are all really essential to making the most of it. Gabriel, do you have a quick follow-up on that? Oh, it's just what Gretchen was saying was making me think of um, some of the work that we've done around shale gas siting in China. And um, yeah, uh, completely. I think if, if the communities that felt like they had some sort of engagement uh, we're much more supportive of the projects. And also I think um, the projects benef benefited from the local knowledges, which I think Gretchen was alluding to a little bit. Sometimes the projects are better designed because local communities know their area better and have suggestions for how to improve things. Let's go on to an audience question. I think the first question is from Kedar. Hey, uh, it was a very interesting presentation and um, uh, carbon pricing is, I think, a very interesting topic topic and a very controversial one as well, if you if you will. Um, so uh, I believe uh, some of these, uh, some of the existing instruments were touched upon as well, uh, voluntary offsets, cap and trade, carbon tax. Um, however, I believe that there are quite a few regions in the world where, you know, no notion or no form of carbon tax exists till date. Uh, and I mean, the the problem of carbon leakage is pretty well known, right? I mean, uh, companies move their carbon intensive operations to other regions where the carbon tax doesn't exist or is very low. Um, I, I was, I mean, I, I think that this problem possibly has very strong socio, socio political uh, implications and whatnot, but I was just wondering, just curious if this problem can be addressed, if this problem can be addressed scientifically and how. A great question, important problem. It is, it is true that there are many parts of the world where the effective carbon price is zero. And um, as a result, when countries that do have carbon prices have those prices or even increase them, there is the phenomenon of leakage that you refer to where industries can move to where the regulations are softer or the prices are zero. Or moreover, they can also, consumers can shift production away from domestic use toward imports coming from countries without, um, with, with lower zero carbon prices. And that would contravene the purpose of regulations in the countries that have the carbon prices, because what happens as a result of those demand side shifts is that emissions increase outside of the more regulated areas to those areas that are less regulated and globally, you don't get much or any reduction. So you've articulated an important problem. The ultimate solution, of course, would be to have a global carbon price with the kinds of compensation schemes that I referred to earlier, where you take the revenue to offset unevenness in the, in the burdens, especially for low-income countries. However, we're not there yet. What do you do in the meantime? And that gets to your question, is there a scientific, is there an option? There is, and that is the countries that are concerned about leakage can introduce border adjustments so as to prevent shifts toward imports from countries that um, otherwise would have, a, uh, have an advantage on international markets by virtue of the fact that they have lower prices and lower regulation. There's also something which is um, called output-based regulation uh, output-based allocation under cap and trade. And without going into the details, it basically helps uh, energy-intensive trade-exposed sectors and helps avoid leakage by keeping, despite the higher regulation in the countries with the higher carbon prices, by keeping things more on an equitable or even basis internationally. That is a second best solution. It is less efficient globally and more costly than would be the case if you could have broad coverage, but it's the kind of thing that may be, a re it is being used and is a kind of stopgap. I would hope that ultimately we can move toward a much more broader based uh, internationally carbon price uh, 
which would take, which would to a large extent deal with the leakage problem. And I think that can still be done in a way that's equitable, provided you make sagacious use of the revenues. All right, thank you so much. Shafiq, do you want to take a shot? I mean, you have global operations uh, at Total, and how do you view this? Uh, you know, it's, it's not a flat world as far as social and cultural <laughs> issues are concerned. So how would you look at your global carbon management scheme uh, well, given think, the heterogeneity? I, I think you're seeing that amongst all the, the major companies where they're trying to um, address it from a global standpoint, things like net zero and trying to say we are focused on scope one, two, and then ultimately three emissions by a given time frame. And when you start putting that into your corporate social responsibility or into your annual reporting, you know, that makes you accountable. And I think this is being done by individual companies because they see the, the need to be acceptable in 20, 30, 40 years, right? And I think this is going to be what drives it amongst the private industry, even though a lot of the political side is in action, there isn't this action at the global level. So I think the major multinationals, you know, for the most part are moving this way. And I think they, they see that uh, kind of moving operations like this carbon leakage is just not going to be acceptable. There's just too much visibility globally on this, right? And you can't hide it. You can't say, oh, I'm going to go put it somewhere nobody sees it. So, so I think this uh, pressure on the big companies for acceptability in the future, especially uh, shareholders, act, um, let's say activity, shareholder uh, pressure is driving a lot of this today. So I, I see there's a lot of self-correction for the big companies. The issue is for more the mid-sized small companies and kind of how they behave. Great. So I know Jenny has a question herself. Jenny, you want to ask? Yeah, thank you. And we did have one come in from the audience, but um, I've been sitting on a couple all day. So this is uh, kind of complex. It covers a lot of things, but I'm particularly interested in the agricultural sector. And this is probably directed to Joe and Don to some degree. So, you know, I was interested in trying to figure out what the incentives would be for farmers to employ sensor techniques and other things to to manage or increase carbon sequestration i'm trying to get a handle on that whole that whole sector and who has the main impacts is it the government is it farmers decide themselves to do something to you know employ new technologies and the other thing is thinking about the future and the technologies that don talked about and biochemical modification of plants to increase photosynthesis now, obviously that's some years off. Let's suppose that it gets into a crop that's uh, useful, whether that's a food crop or a, or a crop that's good for carbon sequestration just in itself. Um, how do we manage to do it in a way that doesn't uh, end in some of the, the things we've seen already with companies deploying modified crops? Um, so, you know, wh what's, what's the way to do that? Um, that involves many players in a way that has the carbon sequestration, the incentives in a way that's not harmful either to farmers or to the environment. Uh, Don started last time, so I'll take this, I'll go first um, as well. Um, from an agricultural standpoint, there's, it's really interesting when you watch farmers uh, actually co-mingle from around the world. You can take a, you can take a farmer from from country A and put them in a room with a farmer from country B and they're immediately, they're, they're like siblings um, because they're, they're actually facing the same challenges. Um, and those challenges are around the vulnerability that they have being exposed to the environment. Uh, matter of fact, a, a very common saying among farmers is that it's the only business where they actually um, buy retail and sell wholesale. Um, and at the end of the day, what every farmer is, is trying to do is optimize their productivity because ultimately that's what their family and everything else actually ultimately um, uh, survive on. So as we think about these incentives, uh, carbon is particularly interesting because for farmers, um, the single most important phenotype is yield because that's the way that we, re we reward them. 
and in the absence of having other other policies to reward them for other behaviors, their their natural inclination is to do whatever it takes to actually drive that, even if it means applying 3x the amount of fertilizer you need at the end of the day, that's cheap insurance relative to being able to mac maximize yield. So one of the things that we need to look at is how we actually help them supplement the, the decisions that they're making um, in order to optimize that return. The other is, and, and that's really addressing short-term return. Long-term return actually is in the land. Um, and land prices are directly correlated to yield. And yield is directly correlated to soil organic matter. So when we start thinking about soil carbon in the soil, um, it has so many benefits to the farmer, uh, whether it's nutrient cycling, uh, uh, water holding capacity, uh, friability of, of, of the soil. Um, it's a reason, there's a reason why soils in, in Don's neck of the wood, woods of Illinois are so much more valuable than they are in you know, other, other parts, parts of the country. So there actually is a number of different ways that we can think about incentivizing farmers um, uh, in addition to what you know, their natural inclination is. Yeah, I mean, I would just amplify on that a little bit, and this is this is somewhat anecdotal, but um, you know, in lots of years, um, even some of the big family farms and industrial farms, um, they're so close to the margin that the only thing that they can do is try to get through to the next year, uh, get enough capital to put seed in the ground and and in fertilizer. And this is the anecdotal part, however, and that was, you know, some years ago, you know, shortly after they started corn ethanol and, you know, and maize went to $6 a bushel. And when that happened, you know, particularly the people that own these big family farms, you know, then they started doing things that were for the long term. As, you know, as Joe said, they know it's all about the soil and they want the family farm to stay in the farm. And so they spent big money putting in, uh, you know, new drainage, um, you know, to prevent erosion. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of them went to uh, more, you know, were able to buy new equipment that, that was, um, had a lower footprint from the standpoint of soil compaction and, um, and uh, you know, were more efficient to operate. And so I, I do believe that particularly the family farms really, want to be stewards of the land and when they have the economic opportunity to do it, they will do it. Um, and so one of the ways I think to incentivize uh, farmers to do that is to get them um, more years away from the margin so they can do these things. And, and I suppose that brings us back, you know, to this notion of, you know, can we put a price on carbon and, um, you know, can we prevent carbon leakage and things like that, that, you know, that make that difficult. So the next question, I think this will probably be the last question from the audience, um, from Jagabundu Hazra. You want to unmute yourself and ask the question. And I think this is for Larry. Hi. Um, so I have a follow-up question on Kedar's, uh, Kedar's uh, part. Uh, its emissions could be direct and indirect, right? So, for example, we talked about leakage where you are doing indirect emissions. Uh, even that is part of your supply chain, uh, you are doing some emissions indirectly. As per the GHG protocol, there are scope 1, scope 2, and scope 3 emissions, right? Uh, so, in carbon tax system, do we only consider in, uh, direct emissions or it also consider indirect emissions? Let me make sure I understand your question. By indirect emissions, do you mean process emissions or do you mean something else? Uh, uh, when I say indirect emission, uh, this is uh, beyond my organizational boundary. For example, let's say I'm running a company. So what is uh, the emission happening within my organization that is direct and anything beyond my organizational boundary is indirect. Well, let me say this. The fundamental problem here is that there is an externality. There's a cost to society associated with any company's emissions. 
that is not usually born, <clears throat> at least in the absence of some pricing or direct regulation, by the decision makers. And as uh, was stated by, by, <clears throat> by Don earlier, and also by Joe, you know, the old the bottom line for, for farmers is you know, profitability and pricing is one way of making the pursuit of profit consistent with the production of the environment. In a more industrial context, the facility is going to be in the absence of pricing, only thinking about uh, the direct costs uh, to it of uh, changing its production process and emissions, those damages won't be taken into account at all. In the presence of carbon pricing, and this might get to your question, do they then consider emissions beyond themselves? I would say uh, generally not, although there are PR issues that I think Joe referred to, by the way, uh, where they may be issues of bad behavior that go beyond. But otherwise, they just think, you know, okay, here's the carbon price, it's changing my uh, benefits and costs from different uh, production options. Let me maximize my profit subject to that. So let me uh, say that in general, I think if to the extent that a firm is really trying to maximize value and satisfy its own stockholders, uh, effects outside of the boundary are not uh, being taken into account. The good news though is, I can't resist another plug for carbon pricing, is that a carbon price will affect costs or prices all the way down the supply chain, not only where it's implemented, but also downstream, like if it's on oil, it'll affect gasoline prices, and that'll affect consumer behavior, and that'll affect uh, prices uh, elsewhere, all the way to the end use. So it means that it's gonna give incentives beyond a particular firm that's being um, targeted, targeted is a bad word, but it's also gonna affect things all the way through the economy so you get good incentives in principle, uh, broadly speaking. And so I think that in a way it makes the concern that firms are mainly concerned with their own outputs and their own emissions less uh, onerous. <clears throat>